Hello everyone and welcome to the Future of Dogs podcast, a place for the whole dog world to come together and ask the big why and what if questions that will shape the dogs of the future. Join me, Hannah Malloy, as we chat to some of the world's most groundbreaking professionals intent on enriching and evolving the future of dogs. This podcast is in association with Amplified Behaviour, my online video learning library for dog owners and dog geeks. Big thanks to my dog's favourite food and our season one sponsor, Nature's Menu. With over 40 years in the pet food business, Nature's Menu is Europe's leading expert in raw and natural pet food. So let's jump into the conversation. Welcome to the future of dogs. It is the long awaited season finale of the future of dogs and what better way to end the series than to step gingerly into the topic that so many have been waiting for the future of dog training and behavior now our future of dogs hardcore fans are going to know already that actually the aim and the format of this podcast has always been designed to look at the past the present and the potential future of each slice of the dog industry from breeding to feeding to rescue and more And in every episode, we have invited a game-changing expert in to come and tell us how they're doing and what they're doing in their field that could potentially shape a new and bright future in their world. So I'll be honest, guys, I was presented with a bit of a conundrum when it came to the future of dog training episodes. How on earth, Hannah Malloy, are you going to uh, present this two-part special without subconsciously presenting either yourself or your guest speaker as the future of dog training? And this is a serious problem for me because I genuinely don't believe that you should ever learn from just one teacher in the field of behavior and training. So the solution to me was clear. In this episode, I've gathered some amazing industry experts from a range of training backgrounds and I've hijacked the what if. So my what if is this, what if dog trainers and behaviorists from different backgrounds and training styles could sit around a table and have a conversation that was full of honor and find that they have many common points of agreement? What if the future of dog training looks like a world where young trainers can model on older trainers from a variety of backgrounds that are able to hold that space for people maybe they might disagree with and learn to listen with love and engage in open-minded discourse and debate. So this episode is going to ask our panel of experienced trainers that teach other trainers about their personal past their unique backgrounds and their experiences, and then what each expert believes the next generation of dog trainers should seek to learn in terms of practical theory and skills. It's not intended to be a conversation about different tools and techniques and training styles, although every expert is invited to passion talk freely without any judgment. For me, at least, the future of dog training is creating spaces and opportunities for us to honour a variety of trainers' backgrounds, learning journeys and experiences, and co-create the trainers of the future. So without further ado, it is my absolute pleasure to introduce uh, two of our panel guests today. We have Les Graham and Kamal Fernandez. Hi, guys. Hi there. Thanks for asking us. Such a pleasure to have you both. I'm going to do a micro bio on you both, if that's all right. And then I would love to hear, um, as I know our audience will, a little bit more um, about your background from your perspective. So, Les, uh, you are an amazing international speaker, a trainer, and an award winning author. And, Les, you founded the Pet Gun Dog Training Movement. Les has an MA in professional practice in canine behaviour and psychology and a postgraduate diploma in advanced research and professional practice. She's also a fellow of the Canine and Feline Behaviour Association and a master trainer with the Guild of Dog Trainers, as well as a Touch for Health consultant, mentor and, get this, firewalking instructor. More on that later, Les. That sounds amazing. (laughs) (laughs) It's always that one that makes people go, oh, really? (laughs) Let's just move this topic out of the way. Talk about walking on fire with me. Um, We might be doing that a bit later anyway, because this topic is big. Uh, Kamal you are equally an absolute G as far as I'm concerned in the world of training we have an internationally renowned dog trainer Kamal is an author a world championship level sports dog coach Kamal has over 31 years experience in the world of dogs and dog training and has helped to promote the use of reinforcement based method 
methodology to train dogs from unruly pets right up to Crufts winners. So, folks, thank you both so much for coming on the show. You're welcome. It's interesting having someone from gun dogs with uh, obedience. It's, it's right. really interesting. It really yeah. pulls the part. That's it. And just a quick shout out. So when we uh, arranged this episode to start with, we actually had four panel guests. Um, and I just wanted to shout out to Joe Rosie Haffenden, who hoped to be with us today. And also to James Penrith, both who were going to jump on the show. And my heart there was actually, oh my gosh, how good would it be to have um, a pet dog training expert and protection dog expert in uh, in Joe. She's a trainer of trainers, massive. Um, James Penrith, who's got um, a lot of background in training as well, a very different perspective on, you know, tools and techniques, but again, an amazing trainer. And each of you actually work in different areas of dog training. Uh, Kamal, you you do a lot of sport dog training. Les, you work a lot with, with pet gun dogs. So, if it would be, if you'd be so kind, Les, do you want to start by just telling us a bit more about your background? How did you get into dog training? And oh my goodness, I was a kinesiologist, which is um, it sits between an acupuncturist and a chiropractor. So that's how I got into dogs. I had my own dog at the time, and um, when you work as a kinesiologist, you can do something called surrogacy, where you can muscle test a person and find out what's going on for, for the animal or the child that they're holding. And um, being dog and horse mad, I thought this is just amazing. So I couldn't really get cracking with the dogs. I was already a Reiki master at the time. Um, and that was it. So I then started a practice doing kinesiology on dogs and horses as well as people. Mm. God, this was... This was way back in 2000 when the the vets weren't really keen on complementary therapies. You know, people were frightened to talk to their vets about it. It was real um, cloak and dagger stuff. And then I moved to New Zealand um, wow. in 2004 and they had no rules out there for working with dogs. It's quite, it, it was a lot stricter in 2000 than it is now. Um, and I set a really good practice up. And what I found is I was working with the dogs and almost in behaviour consults at the same time, you know, so the dog might have tension around, say, for example, the top of its neck and that relates to the stress and then you'd be talking to the owner about their stress and then, you know, talking about putting boundaries in and and I got more and more into the psychological side of it and the behaviour side of it as well as the physical side of it. Uh, then I started training kinesiologists to do work with animals and I just got more and, and more into because working with a prey animal is really different to working with a predator. Mm. You know, the the psychological responses are completely different once they're in pain. Um, and that was it. So I then shadowed, I used to do competitive obedience. Well, I actually do it again now. But in New Zealand, I was working with a guy called Noel Hutchinson, who's no longer with us. And um, he was the only non-food trainer of competitive obedience in New Zealand. And it was all done with motivation with people motivation and um I shadowed him for three years I sat six hours every Monday night at the kennel club building in Ardmore learning learning my craft really wow. yeah, it was amazing he he was an awesome behaviorist and he took me on behavior consults and then I came back and I had to make a decision do I stay with kinesiology or do I move into the behavior world and I jumped. I jumped. I still did <laughs> kinesiology, but it was more for friends and family. Um, I was seeing a lot of uh, gun dogs. I, I was picking up with my dogs. I worked my dogs on shoots. Um, I was seeing a lot of gun dogs with real behaviour issues, you know, repeatedly drawing blood on the owners, destroying the houses. And it was because they had these real high energy working dogs in pet homes and they didn't know how to deal with them. The the gun dog trainers were very much into um, kennel dogs. You know, the dogs got to do this tall, mm. uh, hard handling. And um, so I started seeing a lot of gun dogs. I brought them on the field and trained them to the gun, you know, got the dummies out to really work with their intrinsic behaviour, showed the owners how to live with a, a gun dog. And that was it. So, the pet gun dog started, um, I thought it was 2008, but I actually found a registration form going back to 2007 was when I started my ordinary nice, nice dog classes, if you like, rather than mm -hmm. delinquent gun dog classes. Mm -hmm. uh, and that was it. The book came out in 2010 and it's 
completely changed the way people train gun dogs. We I introduced toys and food and a lot of it was brought across from competitive obedience and search and rescue, search and rescue in New Zealand. So I brought all of that motivational stuff in, if you like, moved, you know, kind of completely against any kind of harsh handling. Um, at the time, there was only one book people were referring to, and it's got a picture of the guy who wrote it holding a spaniel above his head with by his cheeks, you know. Um, and, I, and I thought, we can't, you can't have people doing that to dogs, but you especially can't have families doing it mm. and and you know if mum and dad are doing it then the children are going to grow up and do it mm. and so that was it really so I started movement I moved to Scotland in 2016 took a year out wrote an 18 month training program wow to train people how to be pet gun dog instructors so that's it so they're with me for a full 18 month um and four days assessment so they learn about pet dogs gun dogs behavior how to teach people, you, you know, you can, not everyone can teach people how to train dogs, you know, you get some fantastic trainers, but they can't get that across to an ordinary person. And it's so hard, isn't it? time teaching people how to teach. Not everybody gets into it because they want to work with humans. <laughs> it's a really hard I thing know. to... <laughs> well, we've had people drop out going, oh, I didn't, I didn't realise I had to work with people. It's like, mm, yeah. it's an instructor course. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, the clues in the title. Yeah. And so for you, Les, that early, early stage of stepping from one career path to another, a lot of that was um, mentor driven. So you, you followed someone, you, you were an apprentice, really, you might say to another trainer and behaviorist. And then, and were there any other influences for you at that point? Like, where were you gathering your knowledge from? Were you reading? Massive. massive. So um, uh, Search and Rescue was part of the North Shore uh, a, a, a urban search and rescue team when I first moved to New Zealand my dog hurt his leg so we had to pull because he wouldn't be fit to go through rubble um, then there was Noel Hutchinson in competitive obedience and then when I came home you might know actually Kamal D. Steadman oh yeah yeah I know D. Yeah. Yeah. she's gorgeous so she took me into her wing in 2007 mm-hmm. with my two dogs I landed in because um, I used to live down south and mm-hmm. I used to train at Newbury Oh and right. Yes, I used to see D at um at Business Oak. She's awesome. And she took me under her wing and she showed me how to train with food because when I was in New Zealand, Noel didn't use food, you see. Mm-hmm. So I came back and the amount of times me and Dee sat in a park at Basing Store discussing the merits of food training, boundaries. You you know, we talked about throwing the baby away with the bathwater. Mm. When you first move from one one type of training to another, it's really easy to go too far the other way, you know. So um, I've not trained with food other than with puppies. You know, all the puppy training was done with food. Um, and I can remember starting with D and moving into food and toys and all my boundaries went out the window. So I ended up with like really bad mannered dogs. So I had to pull it all back again. Mm. And, and it was finding that balance, you know, like the pendulum. If you think the pendulum swinging, mm. uh, we are going to talk about the problems in the industry, but the pendulum swings too far. Mm-hmm. It's too radical, goes from mm. too far from one side to the other. And the key, I think, the magic is in the middle. And so you have to learn to swing just like a little bit, the pendulum. So you have your boundaries, you have your motivation, you, you know, you have your discipline, you have the... And, and it's tiny. It's just this tiny little wobble of the pendulum. Um, but then when you go in for the real motivation stuff, then you get the pom-poms out. And it was Dee who taught me that. <laughs> and I'm, she's in all of my books. I've mentioned her in every single book that I've got because she was such an inspiration for me when I moved back to the UK. And in Scotland, um, I take my young dog down to the borders, uh, the Scottish borders, and I do stuff with... Uh, God, I've forgotten his surname. Joel <laughs> of Seal Pin, Seal Pin Gun Dogs. I don't know how I can forget his name. I'm going to have to look his name up. Um, he's awesome. Nice. Hit, hit well, Joe Hipwell. And then I'm also doing competitive obedience at PR as well for my young and And it's uh, Sandra Gordon, who you might oh, know. Yeah. She's Judge So I work with Sandra Gordon as well. So I've still got mentors. So good. So good. Yeah. And such you a need, wonderful privilege. 
when you when you're doing dog sports or high level stuff, you need eyes on you, definitely. We need to we need to work together, don't we? Uh, all of us yeah. do. I think if you're if you're not filming your training sessions, if you are a lone trainer, um, and you're listening to this right now and going, how can I get better if I'm not surrounded by an amazing mentor? Um, actually, just starting to film your training sessions and have that as a as a, a place to start Definitely. and getting some really good um, communities that can give you some feedback is a great place to start. Thank you, Les. Sounds like you've had a really rich w- uh, wealth of support from direct mentorship, which is just so great to hear. Kamal, do you want to tell us a bit more about your um about your background and your experiences too? What was yeah, the early so, stage like for you? Yeah, so um I stumbled into the world of dog training uh somewhat um flukily in that I were I was always passionate about dogs. My family are not um dog people, if you want to call it that, and that it wasn't in our culture, but I always had this really intense passion for dogs and I always tell people that my dad never used to read me um bedtime books he used to read me dog books literally and I so I could probably tell you more about every breed of dog known to man uh or in existence and um, from back in those days and um so I eventually you know pressured my parents as most of us do to get my first dog um who was a uh a, my first dog was actually we got we only lived in Australia for a little while um and through a set of circumstances so I always tell this story because it really does show how life steers your journey so the first actual dog I ever owned was in Australia it was a Kelpie Cross German Shepherd and the dog was literally rin tin tin so this dog could do things that we definitely didn't teach her to do like the first day we got her we took her out uh, for a walk down our road our neighborhood road no lead nothing walked the curb the dog sat well that's apparently what dogs do well we all know that isn't the case so by a set of fate and circumstances what happened was my dad was um it, it got a job offer in England so we all came back to England and unfortunately at the time we couldn't afford financially to bring the dog over we didn't have a lot of money growing up mm. and obviously it would have been quarantine six months of quarantine and so forth so that was a really heartbreaking experience to have to send the dog and she was about six months when she went back mm. so that was another entity you know she would have been in kennels longer than we would have Um, you know she would have been alive so we couldn't justify it for several reasons Mm. so that was a real heartbreaking moment but you know what life is a funny old thing because when we came back to England my parents then succumb again to my badgering them to get a dog and I got probably the canine equivalent of Satan in a little brown (laughs) cow cow s coat but actually I look back now and I have to take ownership it was just our ignorance and naivete of being first time dog owners Mm. and every mistake that you think could be made with a dog we made with that dog but as a result of her she took me into this world of dog training because I was you know watching when back in the day when um Crufts used to be on BBC Two uh and they used to do the breed programs and then they used to do the activity dogs which would feature agility flyball and obedience Mm. and I actually saw somebody doing agility a kid a guy well he's not a kid now he's slower than me uh kid at the time called Greg Derrick. So if you're in agility circles, you know who Greg is. Uh, and I saw him doing it with his crossbreed. And at that time, I assumed you could never do dog shows with a crossbreed. And that actually inspired me to want to do agility. And um, from that, I went to my local dog training class and it was snowballed from that point onwards. And, you know, those were the days when literally the first night I was nine years old, the first lesson I had was was, was how to fit a check chain. And you put the P towards you and et cetera. And we frog marched around the hall for, um, you know, going in a very distinct box. And when the dog went one way, bearing in mind this was the linoleum floor, mm-hmm. who just checked it and went the other way and hoped for the best. So my training has somewhat evolved since then, shall we say. But that dog, I thanked her every single day of my journey because she really steered and moulded who I am today. Mm. Um, and I was fortunate to meet really pivotal people in my dog training journey. So somebody that initially took me under um, their wing, who was very instrumental, it was first and foremost, it was, you know, um, you don't see it so much now. And it's interesting, Les mentioned a couple of dog training clubs. So dog training clubs used to be very much a staple within a community. And Mm. actually, it's funny when um, I listen to Les, because I've been to Ardmore, I've taught at Ardmore, I know the people, She. it's really how our part, how this world is quite small. But I would say back in the day, certainly, The common practice was you went to the local dog club in your local village hall and they were your source of reference, expertise and guidance Mm. when you navigated your first time dog ownership. So they would educate you from everything from, you know, domestic obedience to your source of uh, behavioural problems. Well, if it had separation anxiety, you'd speak to the dog club person. If it had resource guarding, you'd speak to the dog club members and so forth. Mm -hmm. And there was a real sense of community that would be established within those um, uh, um, establishments. 
So for me, they were they. I would say the 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 body of people were very much mentors. They took me under their wing. They used to sort of see me as you know I was so keen and enthusiastic. One of them used to take me to shows and nurtured my love um, for dog training. And then there was a couple of prominent people who recognised. I had an ability or an aptitude for this weird and wonderful thing we call dog training. One certainly was somebody called Sylvia Bishop. Now, it, Sylvia Bishop was an absolute pioneer in dog training. And I would say that if you look around at what we do now, it's because of people like her. Certainly, I would say her in, uh, certainly in her heyday. She was one of the per- few people at the time, and you're talking in the 70s, that talked openly about using reinforcement to train dogs and breaking exercise down into pieces as opposed to lumping. So she was really, really revolutionary in what she did. And she had the, you know, Sylvia could walk the walk and talk the talk. And that not only was she a brilliant um, dog trainer, her dogs were incredibly successful. She's made up, you know, umpteen champions in, in obedience. She's been incredibly se- successful at an elite level. She also successfully coached people to an elite level. And she was one of the first people that internationally um, taught. So, you know, there was a small band of merry men and women that would travel the world sharing their knowledge. And she was absolutely instrumental in that. So we became, you know, very close and very good friends. And she really molded my initial understanding of dog training. And then along the way, I, as an individual, evolved my dog training uh, knowledge and perspective. And, you know, you, you you want to talk about names and mentors, you know, people like, you know, Ian Dunbar was an absolute um, pioneer in dog training. The late, you know, um, John Rogerson, yeah. really, really, um, you know, it, the the it's really interesting when you've been in this sport or this game, I should say, for a little while. You see the trajectory of those individuals' journey. At one point, they were they were considered the new young thing and these like radical ideas. And it's so ironic that if you watch the trajectory of their journey, it's almost like, oh, we don't do that stuff anymore. And again, it's that throwing the baby out with the bathwater conversation again. Mm. So, you know, um, Ian was definitely a huge pioneer in in our industry. Um, He was massively instrumental and, and influential, I would say, for all dog trainers, if I'm honest. Then you had, obviously, Karen Pryor. Um, although I never met Karen, her, her book shaped my thinking and understanding. Mm-hmm. Jean Donaldson, um, Pam Reed, all those real uh, uh, um, legends within what we do, and certainly for reinforcement-based dog training. So my journey sort of evolved, and at the time, I was, you know, a kid, and I was um, I was at college and I was studying psychology. So I was having this information sort of from various sources on a personal interest point of view and a, uh, a, a an academic standpoint. So I was at I I didn't originally go to be a professional dog trainer. I was actually a police officer for eleven years. So that was my initial career. And um, simultaneously to that, I was teaching and coaching and, and traveling abroad, et cetera. I just did it adjacent to my day job, as it were. And um, I, I also um, met, so found somebody again via the internet, Susan Garrett. She's a world-renowned agility trainer from Canada. Uh, and there's several other people that, again, have influenced my journey and and people that, are, that I now qualify as friends, and Susan's a friend now, mm-hmm. that have really steered my thinking and the way in which I approach dog training now. So... You know, I've been very fortunate in that I've been supported, helped, and influenced by some incredible dog trainers, and some that people may not even know, but are absolutely phenomenal. I mean, I've watched literally thousands and thousands of people train dogs, um, and I can spot a good dog trainer with a drop of a hat. I can tell you by looking at the way they walk, the way they hold their lead, whether they have the ability or that they have timing mechanics, all that stuff, and the people that I qualify as mentors have it in abundance and I'm very blessed to have that experience so my my professional and my my career has been very much um, a a mixture of sports and behavior slash domestic dog training should we call it that and that I run classes successfully in London and Sussex for a length of time when I first started my business Um, and I uh, mentored and helped people um, both as, as in my bio suggests from literally pet first time dog trainers to winning at crufts with dogs that were deemed untrainable from first time dog sports enthusiasts to world championship level competitors so i've been very fortunate and that it's you know so it is very much about right time right place mm. um but i've had a you know a very um broad and diverse career so i'm i, I and I'm, I'm constantly learning so i'm very grateful and uh, what a wealth just so amazing um to have had all of those different 
inputs and people to be able to go and hang out with and just yeah. I, by the sounds of it quite open-minded conversation about so training fun. and development. I mean, which is why I'm really looking forward to this conversation because I've, you know, I, I, I'm old enough to, in this game to understand that the conversations that are happening now, as Leslie pointed out pre the recording, they are not new conversations. Mm. It's the platform and the manner in which they're being held that is mm. the change. Mm. You know, and I think that's the thing. The conversations now are no different to 30 years ago when Ian Dunbar, John Fisher, John Rogerson, yeah. um, Colin Tennant were all um, uh, this radical, you know, using food in dog training to pet. <laughs> you know, like, how ridiculous. Oh, it's all going to go to, uh, yeah. you know, uh, um, to the proverbial, as it were. Yeah. Yeah. And they were considered like these ridiculous notions of telling your dog it's rewarding it when it sits and all. And using food, it was, I mean, like I can remember people talking about um, when Ian's, program came on uh television how it was just just poo-hooing it you know how mm. what a load of rubbish mm. using food you know how uh, how will they ever know what a load of rubbish and or, and you think wow how we've as a uh, we mustn't look at it with uh, the glass half full mentality because actually we have come a long way in my yeah. opinion yeah. we have come a long way and i think you know i mean i entered the field of behavior with i went straight to animal behavior just to give you a really brief background check on me you know I wanted to be a dolphin trainer that's what I wanted to do I was like that's the coolest job in the world I'm gonna go do that um and then the documentary Blackfish came out just as I was finishing my degree and I was like I don't think that's where I'm gonna change the world right and so medical detection dogs had proved that dogs could sniff cancer and I was like oh my gosh this creature is incredible I didn't think the world needed another dog trainer and I was like but the sensitivity of dogs for me was just like, wow. Like, and then I just started studying human and dog behavior together. And so I actually didn't get to enter in the traditional route that many trainers do, which is in that community of dog trainers. Um, I kind of stepped in observing it, you might say. And I think that's that's a pretty common narrative for a lot of this generation now of, of new dog trainers who are learning about the field is they're coming at it without that community perspective and kind of going, well, why? Like, why are we teaching dogs to do uh, a 10 minute out of sight down stay? Like, what, what is the reason? Behind? And they're challenging a lot of the... the yeah. yeah. But actually for me, when you step into the field of behaviour, what I loved about it, as you say, Kamal, is that the fathers and mothers of behaviourism are not that old like it's not you know mm-hmm. god love um john rogerson um mm-hmm. may he rest in peace mm-hmm. but it, that was not long ago you know <laughs> uh the the difference that you can make in the field of behavior every mm-hmm. single study you look at every little bit of science that we're all doing by learning right now for me has huge ripple effects so i just thought I, that's it's really interesting you, sorry whilst you before yeah, interrupting you one of the things that i think is definitely contributing to uh, um which has always been the case, the divisiveness within our industry is exactly that mentality. So what I would say, and I'm please excuse me if I'm talking out of school here, mm-hmm. I would say Leslie and I took a similar path in that we started from a very uh, preliminary level and we sort of earned our stripes going up the rank, so to speak, and yeah. that we, we shadow people and we mentored and we, we made cups of tea and we were there, you know, mopping the floor because that was our rite of passage into yeah. this industry over mm-hmm. a protracted period of time. And then you have people of, like of your like yourself who come in it and go, well, I'm going to come up here. And that sometimes can ruffle feathers mm-hmm. to people that have been in this industry a little while. And that always, it always with these things, yeah. it boils down to ego. It's yeah. me saying, how dare you, Hannah, come in and bypass this process that I had to endure? Mm-hmm. And that's, I think, something that we need to let go. It's like, who really cares how you got to the place that you've got? As long as we're on the same page and that we want to move however you choose to walk the walk, yeah. move things forward, as it were. And I think that's definitely a, a part of the, the the issue is that between, if we're talking, never mind methodologies, let's say behaviorists versus dog trainers. That yeah. has always been That's the back of your heads mm-hmm. in that behaviorists will come in with a lot of technical knowledge and et cetera. And the dog trainers in the trenches have been saying, well, we did that. So, and I still stand by that. We have been doing a lot of the stuff for a long period of time. However, there's stuff that um, the scientists have said to shown us that you go, actually, let's challenge that way of thinking. It might mm-hmm. not be the status quo. Let's buck the trend. Let's look at what you're doing and mm-hmm. analyze it. Say, does that what the data supports? And I think that if we hang on to our 
uh, you know, our staunch beliefs and systems, we aren't growing. We're just mm. stagnating. Mm. You know? Um, oh, and I think, you know I what, Carl, there's, there's a super quick, sorry, Les, just to, just to respond to the notion, actually, that because there are a lot of new age dog trainers, you might say, um, and there's so much that I respect about the the process of mentorship and coming up and the humility that occurs yeah. Yeah. because you're you're learning from the bottom up you know if you start in the service industry you you're drying plates and doing washing up right until you get further up in any yeah. of those industries it is worth it mm-hmm. um to do that I think the difficulty from you know I'm mid mid to late 30s let's say so I'm not of the younger generation of new dog trainers um, but I did certainly skip the uh, competitive obedience side of things and went straight in for behaviorism um, but I think it's I think it's lacking I think there's loads of dog trainers out there who would love that level of mentorship but those structures just don't seem to be there for them anymore Les sorry what were you going to say yeah it's because we've lost the dog clubs yeah. it's because we're having a, a lot of the dog clubs have gone Um I think a lot of it as well and it's been around a long time. I, I mean, I attended meetings in London, you know, thrashing out the code of conduct from Cork for the yeah. dog train I think, in 2008. And a lot of it, and I think it's still there. I certainly, I know I've had abuse on Facebook all for it, is the difference between academics and trainers. Yeah. And having just come to the end of another two years of research, um, it's it's very much there, you know, you know what you just think, I'm all about uh, like the trainers and behaviourists, but there's also that element of academics coming in who haven't gone up through the grassroots. And one of the things that I find really interesting, because I so even though I've got qualifications, I don't class myself as an academic. I'm a trainer. I'm, I'm a behaviourist. You know, I I've I went up through the ranks, and um, I I went out to do my master's degree because I was attending meetings with. And I will call them academics. I was attending meetings with academics who'd never held a lead, who were telling behaviorists how to do it. Yeah. And I thought, well, I'm gonna I'm gonna join your ranks because I need somebody who can talk to the academics and talk to the trainers and p- normal people in the street mm. because there was a mismatch of communication. You know, um, the academics might talk about schedules of reinforcement, but the trainer in the village hall, it's the oh, just don't feed your dog every time. Same, same, same pre, you know, yeah. same concept, completely yeah. different language. Yeah. But because they couldn't cross that language barrier, there became a divide. Mm. And oh. I was at the meeting when in, in at, um, at the kennel club when the academics walked out of the meeting because they wouldn't talk to the trainers. I was at the meeting. That's a shame. Yeah, I know. It, it happened when we were trying to thrash out the Code of Conduct by Cork, mm. Companion Animal Welfare Council. They're just like, we, we can't talk to you. And off they went and set up an own, their own organisation because they couldn't communicate. There was a lack of communication. Isn't so it, there was no you know, honour. There was no mm. respect on both sides. Honour is key, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. If, so I think if you, if you strip back all these arguments, if you really scrutinise it down to its bare bones, it always whittles down to our stuff and ego. So yes. our stuff, my insecurities in that I don't feel I fit this uh, mould or I don't meet the dizzy heights of, you know, having a master's or a, a diploma or this or certificate. Mm-hmm. That are, and that insecurity then manifests itself as saying Hannah is wrong because she has those things, mm-hmm. as opposed to saying, it look, Hannah's happy to listen to me. I'm happy to let's just break bread and have a conversation mm-hmm. as mm-hmm. two people that feel passionate about the same thing. And I think that's where often we, and as, you know, social media and the internet is is a dangerous, it's a powerful, I have to, though, let me take that back. It is a powerful tool that can be used for a lot of good, but it also can wield a lot of bad if not mm-hmm. um, understood. And it, again, the amount of times that I think if those two people got in the same room, you would have, and, and maybe had a beer together or, you know, had a meal and broke bread, you would find a very different conversation because you can see the person's body language. You can see their expression. You can see their passion. You can see that actually we have far more in common than we do that is different. Yeah. And I think that's in all, all walks of life. I mean, I, I'm very fortunate in that I seem to be able to navigate both. I, I seem to be able to navigate various camps 
without I'm going to make I'm probably going to shoot myself in the foot here but I do it without <laughs> backlash so yeah. I can you know talk to people that use reinforcement and they welcome me in their camp all good I can talk to people that use other methods and and methods that I choose not to and they will welcome me and say well look what is your opinion in this matter I can do the same with behaviorists I can do the same with dog trainers and I feel it's because I don't offer right from a place of judgment it's like you do you if that works for you and that language, it might take me a minute. I might have to adjust and think, okay, let me look at what they're, not what they are, the words they're using, but what is their intention about their, their approach? Mm. Are they doing it for the betterment of the dog? Are they doing it for the betterment of the human? Are they doing it to make our world a better place for dogs? And I know that sounds so romantic and cliche, but I solemnly believe that the vast majority of us are entered in this industry because A, we love dogs or, or, or and we wanted to help people have a better life with their dogs. Yeah. I absolutely hand on heart believe that. Because why would you then do eight to 12 hours or more sometimes yeah. working with people and their dogs if you didn't like people you didn't like dogs or yeah. you didn't want to see them improve their life with their dog? Mm-hmm. It, because, well, go and do something else. You know, yeah. there's, there's loads of other choices, you know. And, and so I think that I, for me, I, I wish that we would have more literally face-to-face discussions, which is why I was so enthused about this conversation um, to just say to you know, I, I personally, you know, as I've um, I've always tried to be open minded, even when people uh, um, say things that I um, inst- uh, that I initially, I should say, initially go, no, I don't like that. I feel uncomfortable with what you're saying, mm. and then I stop and go, what am I, is my response from ego? Is it from my own securities? And often nine times out of ten, it is. And we all have those. Yeah. You know, so it's really important that we recognize that and then stop for a minute, take a deep breath, you know, pump your brakes. Okay, yeah. now let's, let's start this conversation again. And I'm well into actually picking the brains of those trainers you have, because what you're describing there really, Kamal, is what we call emotional intelligence. <laughs> it's a level of... Um, professional development character development that says I'm going to recognize my feelings and do a Brené Brown and go why am I feeling the way that I'm feeling right now what's behind that is there something that I need to grow in here Um, because I think with anything isn't it once people start getting human reactive um, ah, communication just breaks down because we're not actually talking about the topic anymore we're talking about some childhood trauma that that person is playing out again in a conversation it gets really complicated Les for you we're, 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 we're sitting on the presence right now of dog training. We've talked a bit about um, all of our past. When you look at the dog training world right now in the present, what do you see? Oh, I see. I mean, it's still fractured. It's still a mess, isn't it? Um, I think, okay, look on the positives. I think some really great trainers out there still. I think a lot of it as Kamal said, is there's a lot of egos come into it. There's a lot of um, lack of empathy with each other, which is huge, you know. So as you say, people are doing the best they can, but people get stuck and this is the only way to do it. Mm. And we all do it, you know, and we're kind of developing techniques and stuff. Um, You you know, we're, we're working for the betterment of the dog if social media is really making an echo chamber so it's like i'm doing it this way so everybody joins that group or i'm doing it that way so everyone joins that group but the groups don't talk they just kind of hurl insults at each other Mm. um i think uh, there's there's more education than ever Mm. but there's a huge lack of education as well wow that's a big Um, sentence Mm -hmm. you, you know the the I mean, I don't know if you remember when the KCI program started and there was big gaps, you know, the Kennel Club, because I I was the first person to be an accredited instructor and a preferred education provider at the same time. I don't know if anybody's ever done it since. And I left the scheme because it wasn't working. Mm -hmm. I left. What wasn't Um, working about it, Les? What what didn't work for you? There, there was a lot of hoops to jump through and it was supposed to be a qualification. It wasn't a qualification. It was an award. Mm. It got quite political in the end. But um, I was a mentor for the Kennel Club as well for the KCI programme. And what happened is when the put, it, it, it was it was a one person's brainchild. She went through and she just, she said, this is what we need. 
to be a trainer, which is great, but there was nobody there to support it. So there wasn't the information out there to train the trainers. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people who we've already said you know you can train a dog but you can't necessarily train other people and there was a lot of people jumped on the bandwagon and started training and they weren't sufficiently experienced or whatever to then go and train other trainers how to train people and I think there was a lot of there was a lot of um courses popped up the education wasn't necessarily great there was a lot of egos involved Mm. Uh, there was a lot of this was the only way to do it so that again fractured the dog training like you know I will when I teach for example I tell people about all of the equipment even the equipment that I'm not prepared to use myself Mm -hmm. people need to know about the different types of equipment and they need to know the pros pros and the cons and just because something looks like it's, it's hideous doesn't mean in the right hands it can't be good likewise something that's really passive gentle in the wrong hands can't do a lot of damage and so I think I think a lot of the where education has come about because people were jumping on the KCI bandwagon Mm -hmm. people have to learn how to do this there's nobody going to nobody knows how to do it so I'm going to jump in there and teach them whether they know or not and so I think that's where a lot of the poor education came from but then also because we've got this fracturing echo chambers you know, this is the only way to do it. The only way to train a dog to walk on a loose lead is by putting a harness on it. I've spent mm. two years researching harnesses. Mm. You, you know, so, um, and, and and this is where we get the divide in the industry because of the divide in the education. Yeah. I, that, and that's, that's what I see. You, yeah. you know, I, I, I see a, there's a lot of education out there, but there's also a lot of really, really bad education out there as well. Yeah, I think yeah. it was combined, wasn't it, with also just the the rise in marketing and like the ease of marketing, uh, sort of creating yeah. a sort of business in a box type dog trainer. Yeah. Um, and innovate again, innovation. I love behaviour. I love human behaviour as much as I love dog behaviour. And yeah. so, to be honest with you, just fascinating. Kamal, your background is in psychology uh, too. You must have just been watching this yeah, change, great. and we're like, what? Yeah, absolutely. Hearing Leslie to talk I mean, obviously I've never we've never met um before so it's really interesting yeah. hearing somebody else's perspective that really um uh, brings those points and, and certainly somebody that's had a, a period of time in this industry so you know that definitely in terms of I think the danger of today's society is I thought that was a brilliant sentence there's so much education but yet there's so little education mm. in that anybody can be a dog trainer which yeah. i think is a really f- a massive flaw in our industry yeah now what you know do we get into the, the whole you know do we regulate do we not regulate that's a whole nother conversation but anybody and anybody can be a dog trainer and that, again um you know they can they can portray themselves to be x y and z you know which is why uh, you know um i think it's a very flawed um uh, uh industry in that sense you know, I, I'm I'm going to take full ownership, and that I've chucked my hat in the uh, in the um, circle, so to speak, and that because of my frustrations between um, the quality of training and the quality, the standard, the poor standard of people wanting to be dog trainers, I, you know, essentially what I did was create a business to train dog trainers to be dog trainers, yeah. um, or train people to be dog trainers, because I was so exasperated, and it came really from a genuine intention. So I set up my business in London. And it was really successful. I moved to Sussex and I had my clients going, oh, how do we continue our training? What, you know, when they got other dogs, they wanted to recommend me. I was struggling to recommend people. I really was. And bearing, I had, Shrags literally was down 15 minutes down the road from me. Brilliant. So I used to send clients, but Shrag would reach capacity. And it's like, hang on a second. There's Kamal Fernandes and Shrag within 15 minutes of each other. If you take those two out, why is it that I have nobody else? Mm. In the whole of like, probably like, borderline certainly east london and probably the north of london that i can what people realistically can access that i would comfortably recommend to to take their puppy their cockapoo or their cabochon or whatever poo and shoe and whatever to a puppy class where i felt safe in saying to them you're going to receive a quality level of training with methods that i'm comfortable with um for your puppy and they're going to give you a premium service and so forth and i could not do it and i thought that is appalling Mm. Uh, that is appalling in this day and age um, so out of frustration, I essentially went, right, do you know what, if there isn't an appropriate um, uh, uh, means of accessing quality information and having people, I thought, well, I'm going to create it. Mm-hmm. And I got together with a friend of mine, an amazing dog trainer called Di Martin, and we essentially created this business model where we're now training trainers to be trainers. Mm-hmm. And 
Uh, and we could you could look at what we're doing and say it isn't a certification. The long term plan is certainly to go down that route. But there is a great um, hole in what we do in that one anybody can be a dog trainer. Two the the, the standard of which people um, attain before they become a professional dog trainer. There is no benchmark. Like mm -hmm. I, I always like my benchmark for. The, I'd never did a seminar until I'd, I'd made up an, uh, for me my personal. And this was no nobody told me. This was my own personal standard. Was until I made up a champion. So I wasn't comfortable to stand in a room of like X a hundred people and say this is what I do until I had set that benchmark for my own personal standard. Are you with okay. me? Yeah. And like, I that, so I never took, and I had been asked countless times to do seminars prior to that. And I refused until I said, I won't do one until this is my own personal um, uh, uh, benchmark. And I think that's something that, you know, people, again, when you're, you know, there is a lot more money in what we do now, you know, let's be honest about it. Mm -hmm. You know, you used to go to the local dog club. I think I used to pay a pound a night and your, yeah, me your yeah. membership was a tenner. Yeah. Yeah, like you yeah. know, it's hardly going to break the bank, is it? If you, mm. and it's it's certainly not going to make you in those days. It's not going to make you a healthy living. Now, I would say, and you absolutely can have a very comfortable income from dog training, and I think that's another problem in what we do. In mm. that, the money has definitely become a factor, and that you can have a sustainable income from being a professional dog trainer. Again, you know, like. You know, it looks very sexy. You're going on to different countries. You're staying in hotels. You're being, you know, driven around, you know, doing certain like that. All that people go, oh, wow, that sounds really great. I want mm. a bit of that magic. And you kind of go, um, those things, I think, can distort the intention with which people get into this industry. Mm. And and for me, it's great. And I've been, you know, fortunate to have been very, very lucky in my career. But my, my intention has always been, has always and always will be, how can I help the dog? How can I help the person? And I think that that sometimes can be lost in this discussion um, mm -hmm. in all the discussions we have. For me, mm -hmm. the future of our industry is about, well, I mean, it's too big a thing to say. It's about putting down our spears. It's just putting down our spears, people. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like the ego stuff, just, you know, like we all have it. Like look internally. If there's if you're pointing the finger at somebody else, there's four ping fingers pointing back at you. Do the work on yourself before you, um, yeah, absolutely. Before <laughs> you uh, get into things, I, and I've been guilty of it in the past. Now mm -hmm. I always am now um, present for what I put out on social media. You know, um, um, and I'm present for what I put out in the universe in terms of the things I say, the conduct. Not because of anything to do with karma. It's because who do I want to be as a person? You know, um, and what do I, what is my, um, what impact is my words going to have on the industry? You know, as opposed to just telling um, Les that, uh, Leslie that she's really crap at what she does. Like, other than that, what am I, what am I, all I'm going to do is be hurt. Like, really, and even that, Leslie would probably go, like, whatever, to and move on. So what am I gaining from doing that? Uh, how am I helping the industry move forward? And I think if we, we strip it back to what is your intention, we yeah. would be far better off, really. Yeah. And on that amazing note, we're going to close off this part one and we're going to jump in again to the future of dog training and behaviour part two next week. And that's it for part one of this two-part episode. Tune in next week for the second part of this intriguing conversation and we'll see you next time. <laughs>